welcome to this session exploring the role of insurance in financial resilience. I'm Sarah Parker, Senior Director at the Financial Health Network, and I'm joined today by four panelists representing the wide breadth of the insurance industry. Several years ago, when our organization began to pivot our work around the concept of financial health, resilience was obviously a key component of that. And when we developed our eight key indicators of financial health, insurance made the list as indicator number seven. So we've recognized the unique role that various lines of insurance play in protecting people against shocks in ways that savings and credit simply can't. And yet most of our work up to that point as an organization was focused on the retail banking industry. So we made a conscious effort several years ago to expand our work into the insurance industry, to begin to understand the main players, the main consumer and business challenges, and ways that we could encourage insurers to see themselves as being in the financial resilience business. So I'm really pleased to be able to moderate this discussion today, bringing together both large incumbent carriers and influential insure tech companies to discuss how insurance can indeed be a primary tool for consumer resilience, which is all the more needed in light of the current pandemic. One note of clarification, whereas yesterday, much of the discussion fo focused on health and financial health, including health insurance, today our discussion will primarily focus on life insurance and various types of property and casualty lines of insurance, such as auto. So with that background, let me start by asking each panelist to briefly introduce themselves and their companies, and then we'll dive into the discussion. Um, let's start with you, Peter. My name is Peter Gross. I work on the Emerging Customers team of AXA, uh, the world's second largest insurer. Uh, we're focused on uh, customers in emerging markets that are faced with a lot of risks. Great, thank you. Dan? Uh, hi, I'm Dan Preston. I'm the CEO at Metro Mile. Uh, Metro Mile is uh, per mile car insurance. So instead of paying one flat rate, you pay cents per mile um, and save when you don't drive much. Great. Jen, let's go to you. Sure. Jen Kischel from MetLife, and I have responsibility for thinking about how we engage with employees of our large group customers um, and really thinking about how do we make sure that they understand the benefits that they're being offered through their employer. Great. And Liam? I'm uh, Liam Monaghan, Chief Actuary at Ladder. Uh, at Ladder is life insurance that's instant, simple, affordable, and flexible. And what we do is use data and technology to put the customer in control so they can get life insurance done easily in just a few minutes. Excellent, great. So I wanna start right where we uh, want this discussion to focus, which is on the consumer. And so I'd like each panelist to share what some of the specific consumer challenges are that you have observed people struggle with the most, where insurance and perhaps your companies in particular can play an outsized role in building people's resilience. Um, this can be in general, or it can be perhaps uh, in light of, of COVID-19. Um, so let's just maybe go in reverse order. Liam, do you wanna start us off with that? Sure. Um, so when it comes to resilience, life insurance is crucial in helping families uh, with uh, financial resilience, you know, should the worst happen and a, a loved one is lost, you know, whatever the cause. And, you know, before COVID-19 changed the world, there were 50 million households in the US that didn't have enough life insurance. Um, and that was primarily because it was expensive, um, it was difficult to understand and, and pretty difficult to get. Um, and to buy it, you often needed to meet with a guy um, and he'd often try to sell you a complex product you, know, you, you wouldn't need or, or potentially at a much higher price than you needed to pay. Um, then you'd have to get your blood drawn by another stranger in your home you know, or at your office. And then you'd have to wait weeks or months to see if you'd been accepted or not. Um, so I'm not sure if there's a, a less customer friendly buying process than that, but that it's, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't ideal. Um, but now imagine doing all of that during COVID-19 quarantine, right? So um, you're more aware you need it, but the buying process is, is harder than ever. So the problem we help solve at Ladder hasn't really changed because of COVID-19, but the awareness of how important life insurance is maybe at a modern day high point. And so um, at Ladder, what we do every month is effectively uh, a uh, bank some financial peace of mind for that customer. 
Um, and what we do differently at Bladder is that we use data and technology to make our process contactless, um, simple and affordable. Um, so you know, we can make financial resiliency and peace of mind available to those customers using only their smartphones, wherever they are 24 seven. So because people have to wear so many uh, hats right now, you know, you work a parent, teacher, um, you know, often you have to do all of that at the same time. Um, so, you know, everyone's time and bandwidth to deal with these things has been stretched super thin. Um, so making something as important as life insurance, um, easy and simple is, is huge. And for us, you know, it's, it's all about the customers. So um, that hasn't been the life insurance's focus. Um, they've been, you know, their average NPS is about 26. Um, and in context, the uh, NPS of the DMV is about 54, which is double. Um, so, but what we're very proud of what we've done um, with Ladder is that, you know, we, we have an NPS of 84. And that's something that, you know, we work hard to improve on, you know, every day. Great. And I, and I do want to come back to um, some of your underwriting techniques. And um, there's a lot to dig in there because you, you have innovated in a lot of really interesting ways. Um, let's, uh, let's go to you next, Jen, in terms of some of the consumer challenges that you've observed. Yeah, so I think um, it, it's been a challenge for a long time. I think COVID has heightened that challenge. And the challenge is really that we see the most our employees access to benefits and their understanding of what those benefits are. So the average person who's going through choosing their benefits at their employer is taking less than 15 minutes to make those decisions on what benefits they need for them and their family. And I think there is a gap on communication, both from insurance companies like ourselves and our employers as they're advocating for those employees on making them aware of the benefits, making them understand how those benefits are relevant. And if you think about COVID and Liam spoke about life insurance and, and did a really nice job, so I won't dive in there too deeply, but something like a hospital indemnity plan that's offered through the employer, the average inpatient cost for COVID was $20,000. And so that could bankrupt a family in, in a matter of moments. And so something like a hospital indemnity plan, these are all products that people don't plan for, right? They're things that, oh, that'll never happen to me. Um, I'm not worried about that. And I, I do think there has to be a better connection between what the products are and how they're relevant to individuals, even outside of COVID. So I wouldn't say that's just a pandemic issue. So we've really tried to take a heightened of folks, uh, approach rather with offering a lot more digital access for employees and thinking about the different ways in which employees want to be communicated to. It's not a one size fits all. Someone may want a video, someone may, may want a quick product clip, and someone may want a deep dive into the specifics. And so making sure all of those components are offered to employees during their open enrollment, but even beyond, right? It's not the time to compress everything into a two week period and hope that people understand their benefits, but really thinking how benefits education goes so far across all the remaining months of the year. Um, and so we really think about that in light of understanding consumers wants and needs and really trying to work with employers to direct them to help their employees where they need it the most. Yeah, and your comments really underscore the fact that um, comparing Ladder as a life insurer and MetLife, you actually approach the customer through different channels. We MetLife do. is largely through the employer, Ladder is largely direct to consumer. And so your engagement with the customer will be quite different. And so you, you really underscore that a lot. And there's some interesting things also that we can kind of dig into a little bit more. Um, Dan, how about you? Yeah, uh, so I'll start a bit broadly, um, even before the pandemic, um, you know, in, car insurance has largely been based on proxies to be able to come up with your, your price or your premium. Um, and these are things like demographics or your credit score or whatever that might be. And these are largely not within the customer's control. And it also doesn't adapt very well to any changes that you may have in your life, whether you drive less or you choose alternative ways to get around. Um, that static price has generally been true for a hundred years. Um, and you know, when we introduced per mile insurance, the, the basic initial concept was that when you changed your lifestyle, when you chose to drive less, you would then pay less because you get into more accidents when you drive more. It's been known for a very long time. Um, what's, what's been extending over time that we've learned is the more you can actually lean into um, the, the kind of sensor data that you can get from the car these days, regardless of how, how you access that, um, we are then able to use more and more of the things that are actually within your control. 
um, what kinds of roads you drive on, how fast you speed, other things that are actually more determinant of the risk than these kind of proxy factors that you don't have control over. Um, and I, I think this is a critical part of how financial services will evolve over time and give more and more of that control to customers. I also think it actually extends um, far beyond pricing as well. That's, that's where I think most start. Um, but what we've seen is that there's also a lack of control throughout the whole product experience. So in addition to not having control of, of, your, of the price that you get, um, when you file a claim, you also are generally reliant on how that carrier ends up treating you, your claim, and manages that through body shops and others. And so a big part of this as well is if, if you can, through the use of better technology, find ways of better managing claims, you can also put that process more in the hands of consumers where they can actually manage through more uncertain periods of their life. Um, so that, that's more kind of thematically where um, I think car insurance and many other lines of insurance are, are heading. Um, in the pandemic, I think auto insurance had a particularly um, interesting, there's a particularly interesting impact where um, everyone started driving a lot less. Um, the initial impact from you know, the end of, uh, I think it was March and into April was about 60% from pre-COVID to like the very bottom. Um, and what that meant for us was about, uh, we ended up with about 30% less revenue. So our customers were paying 30% less. Um, and you, you then started to see carriers all across the country starting to give you know, discounts um, of some level because they were extremely profitable during that period. Um, and it was reflective of the fact that people just weren't getting into accidents because they were driving less. And so what, what we've seen is there is a strong desire and a strong demand for products that now actually fit a lot of new lifestyles. Um, regardless of whether or not we get like a vaccine tomorrow, there are gonna be a lot of people who choose to work from home, who have now changed where they live, have different commutes, um, have changed jobs. There are many people who are still gonna be out of work for a long period of time. And so being able to have the options to be able to pay for the actual insurance that you need, as opposed to saying, paying the same thing as you did pre-COVID, um, I think is a critical part of that kind of resiliency. Um, and I think products that are tailored to kind of changes in lifestyle can be really important for that. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned how all of the big auto insurers gave rebates because people were, were driving less. And it, it, I think for the most part was just kind of a set percentage or an exact dollar amount. I assume your model is such that you didn't have to make any of those adjustments. It just, that's part of how you have, have arranged your business. That is people that drive less, they pay less. Yeah, for sure. Well, the nice thing is if, if you drive less, you're not going to pay for it at all. So um, we actually had a lot of customers come to us because they effectively stopped driving. And many of the discounts that we've seen are on the order of 10, 15%. Um, but we had customers who were saving you know, 70% because all they were paying was their monthly fixed costs. Um, so yeah, we, we never actually needed to change anything with the model. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Peter, how about you? Uh, what do you what have you been seeing in, in ways of um, consumer challenges? Yeah, um, so I, I think if you live on you know two to twenty dollars of income a day, which is really the customer segment that we target in our in our emerging customers group, you know this is four billion people around the world. You're worried every day. You're preoccupied with risk every day. You, you don't know what's going to happen. You're anxious. Um, it, it all, you know, news coming in is bad news. That, that's sort of the whole world's experience now. You know, we're all afraid. We are all worried. Um, and so in a way, we can now put ourselves in the shoes of, you know, the 4 billion members of the, of, of the global population that deal with this all the time. Um, to, to reach that population, we had to become customer-centric as AXA, because uh, there was no way to reach the customer base otherwise. And I think the reality is that our industry has been pretty terrible. Um, you know, the customer has really been seen as the enemy. Um, we call, you know, when you get what you paid for from an insurance company, it's called a loss. <laughs> I mean, really? You know, um, we call our features benefits, you know, like, you don't talk about the features of a, of a computer you're working on, the benefits of that computer. No, it's just the things that you paid for. Um, and so we have all, you know, all these ideas in our industry that I think are very anti-customer. And uh, what we've learned in our segment of AXA is that, uh, you know, we have to turn that completely on its head to, to reach this market and create a new market where there hasn't been one before. And I think that's what the industry as a whole is, is really seeing. You know, if, if you were to sort of take a basic user experience 101 class uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley, 
you know, insurance breaks every single rule in the book. You know, the product is not easy to understand. You can't sort of access it easily. You can't, you know, all the things that Liam and others have said, uh, we think that you can actually build insurance the same way that other products have been built and the same way other industries run, which is with products that can be understood, um, that people are actually excited to learn about and understand. Um, you know, when you face a lot of risk and someone comes with a solution to your risk, um, that's going to excite you. The reason why people aren't excited about insurance right now is because we haven't historically done that. Um, so in Axe Emerging Customers, we're really doing that with this brand new market from the ground up and ensuring that these products can be explained in one minute or less. They can be communicated in three SMSs. You know, they have very, very clear benefits that, that really meet people where they are. Uh, and so I can go more into the, the things we're doing around COVID, um, but, but I think there's a really interesting opportunity here and that the segment that we serve specifically is sort of a bellwether to where the industry is going next. Yeah, great. And I do want to come back to some of your experience of how you have reached very low income populations around the world profitably in a way that makes sense for the business, the insurance company, and really makes sense for the, the customer. So, you know, like many industries, I've seen the insurance industry really reflect on how this moment of a global pandemic presents companies with, you know, an opportunity for positive change. So things like increased flexibility for their customers, um, better income protection products, being more digitally friendly for sure, reaching all segments of society in a more inclusive way. So I'd like to ask each of you how you see the current crisis really setting the stage for this change in your companies. Um, and Dan, let me start with you. You know, as you said, Metro Mile was really founded on the principles of flexibility based on how much you drive. Um, and so how have you seen the current crisis emphasize the importance of this flexibility even more? And, you know, you mentioned this in your opening remarks, but what are some other areas of flexibility that you, that you think, you know, can or should be offered to insurance companies, either by Metro Mile or even just the industry more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so certainly what we've seen in the, during this period is a pretty large shift in the way that people are getting to work, what their work actually is, um, and what the use of that car looks like. In fact, we're, we're actually seeing driving starting to come back close to normal, but it's entirely different driving patterns. Um, and so it looks a lot less like your daily commute and other ways of getting around when you need to actually drive. And so um, I think a lot of what our customers have been asking for, um, in many ways we, we deliver it today through the per mile insurance product, but is in general, just the flexibility to be able to pay for the kind of risk that you actually have. And so um, as, as part of that, and I think there were, uh, and there continue to be new ideas that are coming up um, even before this period for being able to pick and choose the periods of time where you wanna get insured for whatever that might be. Um, and I think when we were in a little bit more of like a steady state before where the economy was continuing to grow in the way it was, um, that, that market was still somewhat nascent, but I think this is a moment in time where you start to really realize that um, you know, your, your needs can shift on a day-to-day -day basis um, in a way that you may not expect. And so being able to have that flexibility to access that quickly. Um, and, and I would say that the, um, one of the fundamentals there needs to be how you are able to then access that. You can't um, force customers to go through a lot of friction to ultimately go and find the options that they need. Um, and that leads to maybe your second question, which is kind of maybe going beyond just the an initial pricing model, what does an experience need to look like? Um, and so a lot of a lot of the focus in our early product development was around, you know, how can we help people with the uncertainty of car ownership in general, which in many ways is what car insurance is about, is the uncertainty of getting to an accident. But there are other things associated with that, like getting a parking ticket or how, needing your car repaired or whatever that might be. Um, and so in a world where you may not use your car often, but you may need it, um, being able to help people through um, or be able to help people with many of the things that are uncertain about owning a car in general, these things that are not necessarily at the core of what insurance typically is defined as can be a really critical part of the, the value that you ultimately deliver um, as an insurer. Um, and so I think uh, insurers in general will need to continue to think about more broadly what they offer beyond just kind of the core coverages that um, are typically thought of as part of insurance. Yeah. And you obviously are working in a really interesting space with an insurance. I mean, insurance industry writ large is very, very broad. Um, but auto insurance is one of the few that is required by law. I mean, you have to have a certain minimum coverage to, to own and drive a vehicle. So in some ways, 
the flexibility you offer is so much more important to customers because they really have no choice to opt out. Right. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. <laughs> Um, great. Let's go to you, Jen. So as part of MetLife's workforce engagement that you work on, what have you seen as some opportunities to, you know, further engage with your customers to truly focus on their wellness and resilience? And, you know, you're obviously working more through the employer channel, which can bring its own set of challenges. Yeah, so I think it's a, a fantastic opportunity for, for the group insurance space at this time, because I think now more than ever, while employees may not be physically in the workplace, they're more dependent on their employer than ever, right? When they think about their financial wellness and their resiliency, a lot of that gets tied back to what the employer is offering. And so we've seen very direct correlations between employee satisfaction and PS with their employer and the amount of benefits they're offering as an example. One of the things that I'm excited that has come out of this though is really a switch to digital, right? So a lot of employers still focused on mailing things home to employees, which is good, except then you can't access the benefits when you're at home because you can only do them on your work computer, which all should change now with people having access to work from home, what they may never have had before. I do think it's a great opportunity too, though, for those instances where perhaps that material wasn't sent home, for employer employees rather to go and talk to their families and their spouse, right? More than ever, these decisions need to be made. If you have a significant other or a spouse that leads up the household with you, you need to make those decisions together. And so I do think that there, this, uh, this pandemic situation and people being uh, accessing work from home, they can go to the dinner table and have the conversations much more easily and remember that they just saw that email versus going home uh, from work, commuting and then forgetting about it. The other thing I think um, that is really helpful for us, hopefully, is employees want a trusted advisor, right? They, they want to know if you go back 15, 20 years ago, everybody knew who their HR person was. They had a great relationship. It was like a 20 to one, right? There was an HR person for maybe 20 employees, maybe 50, but they knew them all. And if they had a question on their benefits, they walked into that HR person's office and they said, hey, help me with this. I don't understand the difference between these two options, whether that be health insurance, dental insurance, or something else. How much life insurance should I buy for my family and I? And so now I think there is... Um, an increasing need for managers to be more fluid and flexible and understanding of what the benefits are. And in no way am I saying that they need to be able to be an insurance advisor and, and tell people exactly what they need, but they need to know where to direct people and how to help them get access to the information that they're looking for. And I think that is so important. I do think also that offering financial wellness components in the workplace will be more important than ever. And if you think about things like seminars that employers used to offer, they traditionally did them in person. And so the, the attendance may be limited by someone who has a conflict of that one hour of their day or couldn't be in the office that day for whatever reason. And now being able to go to a virtual environment where those sessions can be offered multiple times a day, they can be online on demand so folks can go back and review them afterwards. That gives me a lot of hope that more people will get access to financial information that they may not have had before and be able to make some more critical decisions about how to handle their own wealth um, or lack thereof, um, as, as Peter talked about, and, and just being able to, to move from, from one facet to the other and no longer is it employee and, and I'm a home person right now, your worlds are coming closer together. And I think that's really key for employees uh, and employers. I think there's a great opportunity in front of all of us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we definitely are seeing the workplace change in pretty significant ways. Um, Liam, let me go to you. So you had explained how Ladder is, is a life insurance tech that's really testing new ways of protecting consumers by the way that you acquire customers, underwrite, um, and the whole experience. Um, how are you able to better offer flexibility and just speak a little bit more about how you can reach more customers through through your approach? Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, we, you know, we, we, we feel like we can reach a really wide range of customers. We we offer coverage from $100,000 all the way up to $8 million. So right there, we're able to, to really um, engage with a broad a variety of customers um, and offer them the, the same great experience. Um, and, and Ladder is, is flexible in many ways, but um, I'll highlight two key ones that I think um, are, are pretty important um, just to, to give you, to give you uh, that context. So uh, the, first, the first is really about just being folks being able to access life insurance anywhere. So 
we see actually a lot of our engagement happening outside of office hours, the traditional office hours anyway. So um, we can allow folks to, to access you know, our product 24 seven, three, six, five. So when they need it, they, they can get it. Um, and that's, that's pretty huge um, in closing the coverage gap that we see with a, a lot of those families I mentioned before. So that's the first key one is just being available. Um, th that alone is, is uh, allows people to, you know, the flexibility to engage with it when, when it, uh, um, they can actually get it done. Um, the second key thing uh, that we have is a, is a really cool feature we call laddering. So that allows the, the customer, um, uh, they can apply for more coverage when they need it, or they can lower their coverage at the touch of a button um, in their account page. So when they lower their coverage, their payments simply drop in the same proportion. Um, so for example, if you halve your, your uh, coverage, you, you cut your payments in half. Um, and that, that sounds you know, pretty obvious and, 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 and uh, <laughs> pretty intuitive, but in fact that we were uh, the, the first to introduce it in, in this instant fashion. So um, that kind of flexibility allows um, make sure that the, the customer has their, their coverage uh, that fits like a glove when their financial picture changes. Um, and so, you know, if folks are experiencing tough times, especially, you know, during, during the, the, the pandemic, you know, it's easy for them to keep some of their coverage in place um, and reduce payments so that it becomes something a lot more manageable for them rather than simply having their coverage lapse and having nothing at all. Um, and that's, it, it sounds really obvious, um, but it's actually something that is not common in the industry where there are policy fees, there are, are, are um, it, it makes it, they make the, it very difficult for the customer to adjust their coverage. Um, so often you would either pay us in full or cancel. Um, and those are the only options. So um, the way we offer this is, is a, 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 just an example of how we're able to be really flexible. And at the end of the day, it's also, you know, what, what Dan was saying is, as well is it's about putting the customer in control. So giving them the tools to be able to adapt and change as their circumstances change is really, really powerful. Um, uh, not only in, in attracting customers, but also just in providing them the solution that meets their needs. So again, it goes back to about putting that customer in control. I have, I have two quick follow-up questions on that because that is really interesting about being able to decrease or increase coverage. So you gave the example of decreasing coverage where then your payments just simply are reduced. How does it work when you increase coverage? Because in a normal life insurance policy, increasing coverage requires a whole new underwriting process. Um, you know, it, it's actually quite complex. You can't just say, oh, I, I wanna add $100,000 to my policy. So how, how do you uh, handle those who, those who want to increase? And then related to that, you know, what I hear a lot from, um, what I hear a lot in the industry around all of these life insure techs like Ladder and others that are, are really innovating around underwriting, mainly through not requiring medical exam, liquids, all of those things, is a bit of skepticism about will this underwriting technique hold true 10, 20, 30 years down the line? I'm sure you have some really interesting thoughts on that since you lead, you know, you're the chief actuary at Ladder. So can you just comment briefly on those two points? I know those are big questions, but but just briefly. Yeah, sure, no problem. So um so how we handle increase? So um, I, was, I was very careful about the wording there where I say you can apply for more, right? So um, there's no guarantee that you'll be accepted. And the reason why we don't do that is because that will, that, that's an option that we'd have to price and increase the price. So we want to make it as affordable for anyone. But what we do, a lot of the innovation and the power um, of Ladder is really under the hood. Um, it's a lot of it in the underwriting tech um, that we've built. So if we're able to, to gather data that allows us to um, instantly offer um, that increase, we'll do that. And so we have uh, incredibly, uh, I don't want to give away uh, the exact number, but we have many, many um, different underwriting paths that we can put a customer through. So we can reuse information that's fresh. We can collect only the information that we need. We can decide we have enough and instantly issue. So in order for us to keep the, the pricing affordable, um, and that's one of the key tenants of, of making it accessible, we need to be able to be very flexible in how we underwrite folks. So when someone has a, a need, you know, we're able to, um, to offer them that coverage uh, uh, pretty easily uh, and in a very different way than having to put them through everything um, all over again. So that's sort of a, the, the, the quick answer to that is, is we have very flexible underwriting that allows us to get just what we need. Um, the, the second piece of it is, 
uh, talking about kind of underwriting skepticism. So, you know, we, we have, again, many different underwriting paths that we're able to, to put the customer through. So um, I'll give you an, an example of innovation uh, that we've been able to, to make, to bring to the customers. So um, when we, we collect data on customers that allow us to, to underwrite instantly, uh, we may find that we don't have enough um, information to offer a customer an, an instant offer right, right away. What we do there is we, one example of what we can do is we actually have mail-in saliva test kits that we allow folks to uh, use at home. So if you think of something like 23andMe or, or even, even a Warby Parker where you can try on your, you know, your glasses at home, um, we have the ability for folks to uh, collect their own sample and, and mail that back into us. So we have different ways that we're able to collect more information when we need it. Um, and that all goes back to how do we make the customer experience great? How do we keep that NPS high? But importantly, how do we also keep that price affordable for customers? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, that's great. Um, Peter, let me turn to you. So as you mentioned, you work on, on Axis Emerging Customers team serving very low income populations in the developing world and emerging markets. Um, and a lot of people with strapped incomes, you know, whether they live here in the U.S. or in other countries, often assume that they can't afford insurance, even though they know, and research has shown again and again, that they know it's important and it's a, it's a critical tool. Um, and sometimes insurers, on the flip side, also think that they can't profitably offer insurance to low-income populations. So how have you overcome this barrier in your work? Yeah, well, I, I just have to say first, I'm, I'm loving... Um, how revolutionary the ideas from Ladder and Metro Mile are. They, they shouldn't be revolutionary, um, but in, in our industry, they are. You know, you use less, you pay less. Um, you know, you want more, you you up your your, your premium and pay more. You know, the, these should not be as revolutionary as they are. And I'm, I'm grateful for the Ladders and Metro Miles. Um, and obviously the innovations MetLife is doing as well. Uh, we really find, as I mentioned before, that in this emerging customer space, this landscape in in Latin America, Africa, Asia, where we operate, but also um, it, it applies to low-income environments in, in the U.S. and in Europe, where risk is so prevalent, um, we're finding that we have to operate in a customer-centric way to, to get access to the customer in the first place. Um, you know, I, I have, I think, three credit cards, and I did a count about a year ago on the number of insurance policies I have on those credit cards. I think it was like 27. Um, I have 27 insurance policies on three credit cards. I only found out I had those policies because I went looking. And then when I went to find how much I'm paying for them, what the terms are and how to make a claim, I could find nothing. The click pads were circular. The phone numbers didn't answer. The emails went unanswered. This isn't insurance. This is theft. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th this is not a service that's, even, that's being provided. This is just people making money in the dark and we're to blame for it. And the banks are to blame for it. And, and so, you know, we can't grow in a new market that way. And so that's what Ladder and Metro Mile and, and MetLife and us are, 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 are confident about. Um, and so, you know, our way of doing this in AXA is to say, you know, we're actually sitting on a gold mine here. The, 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 the idea that you can be protected from risks you face um, if, you, if you buy this product is an incredible idea. And so let's not hide that under a stack of paperwork and keep people away from that product Let's instead use the emotional resonance of risks that low-income customers face every day to partner with major brands globally and say, make this promise of protection from risk at the heart of your brand promise to your customers. And so in my career in 10 years, I've been involved in products reaching out to more than 60 million uh, customers with their first ever insurance policies. And, and this is because we put insurance effectively as a marketing tool saying, if you will be more loyal, if you will, um, you know, maybe spend a little bit more with our brand and the competitor, then we'll reward you with an insurance policy that's, that's not hidden again under, under all the terms and conditions, but rather is right out in front of why you might engage with, uh, you know, with that brand in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so then that means that we, as an insurer, have a responsibility to have a simple product that pays in seconds, not in weeks, and all the other things that you expect from any product that you buy. And when we're able to do that and give people that first experience of insurance, they say this is great and they tell their whole communities about it. I've seen, uh, there was a village in West Africa or a small town in West Africa that hired uh, coaches, buses, to bring the entire adult population to the nearest town to sign up for the insurance policy uh, after they saw that it worked out. Um, 
you know, people do have money to spend on products they value. Our job in the insurance industry is to show them why they should value us. And that's what we're doing at AXA. Yeah, that's really inspiring. And you have been leading the way, um, it, especially in your work overseas, around how to effectively bundle insurance onto products that people are already using, but in a way that's very transparent. I mean, I think we can all relate to the image that you shared of, you know, stepping up to the car rental counter. They ask you, do you want to buy the protection, the insurance? And you're like, ah, does my credit card cover it? Should I pay? And it's just so confusing. It's very, very unclear. Um, so, you know, we're living through a unique time right now, not just because of COVID, but also because of recent racial unrest that has brought to the fore yet again, the severe racial injustices that exist in our country. And so I, I'm curious um, to hear what this time is teaching the industry about the importance and viability of better serving customers from all segments of society in a more inclusive way. And Dan, I'm particularly interested in your thoughts on this because you know car insurance has a very bad history of discrimination in its underwriting. And you mentioned the ways that underwriting is usually done, which it uses proxies that are not necessarily tied to risk. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in your thoughts because I think Metro Mile is really, um, is, is a great solution to some of these um, racial disparities. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm really glad you asked the question. Uh, we've We've actually been talking about this a lot um, as a company, um, especially in the last several weeks. Um, and yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. A lot of the variables that are used right now to pricing insurance um, are likely not fair. Um, and you know, the number of states have gotten rid of things like credit and others and California is in that bucket. Mm -hmm. um, and I expect that that's gonna continue. Um, my, my hope is that um, we'll see continued adoption of more and more like behavioral based insurance, like this use of sensor data is a way to do that, because it's a far better reflection of what the true risk is. Even so doing though, you still need to be careful um, in the ways that you ultimately define what those are. And so um, we, we have an, an, a number of ongoing questions um, as a company about how do we best define the things that ultimately determine what we believe is the risk that then ultimately comes up with the price in the end. Um, and so, you know, I, I believe that over time, we'll be able to get rid of the vast majority of the kinds of variables that, that you're referencing, things like credit or whatever that might be, um, that can be discriminatory. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's a really important role for insurers across every line of insurance to do a better job here. Um, and I think the technology now actually makes that a lot more possible where you can still create a competitive dynamic in the market, um, but by using data and other ways of measuring that in ways that are far more within the customer's control. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with it from us more. Yeah, no, that's great. So we, we only have a few minutes left. So I want to um, ask one last question to each of the panelists. Um, you know, again, the current environment has really forced a lot of quick adjustments among insurers. Um, companies that have been talking about going digital for years have now really been forced to do so in weeks. Uh, so you kind of wonder why it took years. Um, but I'm interested just in kind of some closing thoughts from each of you. What are some of the changes coming from these current circumstances that actually may have the silver lining of improving aspects of the insurance industry? Um, ways that the industry ways that the industry can serve customers better going forward. Um, so I think in, in, in general, my question is, what are you encouraged by as you look at your peers in the industry, really from a, a customer lens? Um, Liam, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, um, I think that there's a myth in the life insurance industry that life insurance is sold and not bought. And I think uh, you know, ladder exists and thrives as a proof that that, that is a myth. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's about, um, for us, it's about having that deep customer empathy. Um, you get to build that trust with a customer, you get to offer them something, you know, directly uh, to them that allows them to be in control. And, you know, we have the opportunity to actually delight the customer by, by having a great experience. So, um, you know, when we, when we look at it, you know, the, the real hard work is, is not about kind of, uh, putting on a, a shiny front end or, or a nice website, the real, the real hard work is all under the hood. It's about doing the underwriting correctly, you know, being fair, being equitable, making sure that you're making uh, the, the right kind of underwriting decisions, building in that flexibility um, so that 
you know, when customers have things that happen in their lives, you can adapt to them, you know, meeting them where they are, you know, on their phones, ready to transact any time of the day. You know, those are, those are the things that are incredibly uh, difficult and, and really hard work. And we started those, you know, well before COVID-19 hit, mm -hmm. um, because now as an industry, you know, we've got to work even harder than ever to, to make sure that those 50 million families have the coverage they need. And so I think about, you know, it goes back to really listening to people, having that customer empathy and then solving real customer problems. So um, I think as an industry where they could get, we could sort of get by on doing the things we've done. Now we have to really get back in touch with that customer and help them do what they need to do. Yeah, great. Jen, how about you? What do you see as some of the silver linings for ways we can better serve customers? Yeah, so as, as Liam was speaking, um, it reminded me of, of something that we are launching soon, which is our digital will program. And when you think about the pandemic and, and financial health and resiliency, estate planning is so important um, to have that will if, if something were to happen to you. And so very similar, obviously completely different products, right? A will versus life insurance, but we'll have a, a full digital offering where someone can get a notary digitally. Um, you can do the entire thing on your phone if you want or on your iPad or your computer. Um, we were um, pleased to offer this to healthcare workers across the country. Um, as our first pilot, um, it will be included in our, our um, MetLife Legal Plans program going forward. But we had some phenomenal stories from some of our frontline heroes. Um, an individual that, that stuck out to me was a woman who wrote in saying both her and her husband are physicians in New York City. Uh, they have a three-year-old. Um, and ha being able to go through this process and create a will for both her and her husband put such a peace of mind for them. If something were to happen to both of them while they were um, you know, exposed to COVID in such a dramatic way in, in the March and April timeframe just gave such a peace of mind. And I think, I think absolutely, as folks have talked about, it's about the end consumer. How do they access information? How quickly can they do what they need to do? How does that, what does that experience feel like? And can they walk away with something that they value? Um, and, and so I'm very excited about that. And, and some of the other digital enhancements I've seen MetLife and our peers make too, I think will just improve the overall industry. And, and again, insurance is always the bad guy, right? And we've got a lot of black clouds hanging above our heads, but I think we're, we're doing the right things and taking the right steps to improve that for consumers and, and just to provide more transparency. Yeah, that's great. Um, Dan? Yeah, um, you know, I think change tends to be um, driven by customers and what they're demanding from their insurance companies. and. Um, you know, I, I think if there's a silver lining or maybe a couple from these last few months, um, both the demand from customers to get flexible products to be able to meet their actual needs now in the way that they now move around or see risk in different ways or whatever that might be is going to drive, I think, all insurers to go and rethink the way that they structure their products. And it's going to be a really meaningful long-term benefit. And the, the, the more recent kind of elevation of the importance of racial justice and um, disparity, I, I think is also going to force a lot of insurers to think differently about how they structure their products. And so, you know, my, my hope is that insurers will be responsive to those needs. And I think they will because there's enough competition and new companies coming out that that change will happen. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling hopeful about those ultimate changes. Um, I think it's really hard right now, but I'm hopeful that there will be a number of changes that for the long term that can really help people. Yeah, it's often the long game. Um, Peter, we have just a minute left. How about from your perspective? What makes you hopeful as you look around at the industry? Yeah, Axe is on a big campaign to become, to move from payer to partner, uh, to, to be really aligned with our customer base, to help them not just um, have financial uh, you know, uh, payments when there's a risk that materializes, but to help them prepare for, be better educated, be better prepared overall. So our big change right now is moving toward telemedicine in a big way. In emerging markets alone, we've launched 10 telemedicine programs uh, from scratch since COVID started uh, that serve uh, uh, currently 600,000 people and will grow to a million and a half in the next year. And that really moves not just uh, you know, telemedicine service forward, but it allows people to be safer, uh, you know, not exposed to, to health facilities when they don't need to be, and increase access to, to healthcare at a lower cost. And so that's been a change that's been, again, waiting for a long time, and we're, we're moving ahead rapidly with that now. 
That's great. Fantastic. Well, I think Jen said it best that, you know, insurance is really all about peace of mind and it's about providing resilience when an inevitable shock comes up in someone's life. So I think we have, um, we've learned a lot from all of your experiences. With that, we need to close. I wanna thank, um, thank you to our panelists for sharing their insights today, to our audience for your engagement. Um, thanks so much.